Hello, my name is Colin Goldberg, and uh, we're here at the Tech Expressionist Salon number 67. Um, today is Wednesday, April 12th, 2023. And um, the topic of the discussion tonight, um, the sort of title that I put on the graphic, the promo graphic was untitled um, because I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, but it seems like the initial pre-discussion has been about the topic of AI, which we've had a couple salons on in the past. It certainly is something that's sort of becoming more and more a topic of mainstream discussion, um, both amongst artists and non-artists, um, scientists and sociologists and all sorts of different types of people. So um, some of the some of the preliminary discussion has been a little bit about some of the um, more uh, troublesome or alarming implications of AI. And um, you know, with that, I'd like to open it up. And certainly, once again, if any of the artists present have work that they'd like to show related to this topic, um, certainly feel free to do so. And, um, you know, if anyone would like to um, kick it off, I guess, you know, we can kind of leave it free form. I don't know if we need to really even go to a show of hands at this point, since it's not formal presentations. It's just going to be more of a conversation. Um, so with that, um, I know Renata kind of brought the topic up. So do you, do you feel like you'd like to kind of kick, kick the discussion off, Renata? You're muted. Thank you, Colin. I was just thinking on what Lee said to us a few moments ago before we started recording about a judge having to decide whether a certain percentage of work, whether it be written work or visual work, needs to be altered in order for it to get a copyright. And that, ever since I've been using AI, which I started about June of last year, I always alter it. I, I don't want to put up just a straight text to image image. So I feel like that's some it that somehow that helps me to do it that way. Well, per, currently a uh, reading that I just did this past week has indicated that the um, patent office uh, is not, has ruled that strict images created from uh, hex prompts uh, are not copyrightable in and of themselves. They're, they're just saying that you cannot copyright strictly uh, text to image AI. Now, I haven't heard, uh, you know, the, what the percentage of change needs to be. Uh, the patent office right now is saying it's on a case-by-case -case basis from the article that I read. Uh, but it sounds like uh, the patent attorney that uh, Lee was citing, uh, you know, put, put a percentage out there. Uh, so I, I think the, the thing is right now um, that if there is not a discernible hand of the artist, in the image, it's not copyrightable. That, that's, the, that's the US Patent Office saying that right now. What, 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 what I find problem, uh, what I find problematic about that is that um, the sine qua non of copyright is that there be human input, okay? Period, human input. Um, I can see if AI just spontaneously generated an image on its own, but it does not. When you have text to image, you know, generators, you have to have a prompt that's written by a human being. That is a vision that is set forth by the human being that becomes the de facto parameters of the image that will be created, be it good work or not. So there is the human factor there. And not only that, but the the universe, the mini universe in which uh, the artwork has been created has been, um, has boundaries that are created by a human being. So how then can you say that the human being cannot copyright a vision? I mean, if I had an assistant and I said, you know, draw me a pencil 
with a, a, a bobblehead of Richard Nixon on it or something like that. And it did so, okay, and that was my employee. Oh, that's my work, according to current U.S. copyright law. So now we have chat GPT, which for some of us is still free, you know, and we're saying, give me this that I tell you and extrapolate where you may, but, you know, give me these basic parameters and it does, then how is that not uh, something that's uh, initiated by a human being? It is initiated by a human being. So I think that some of these judgments are being derived because the judges are biased. You know, they don't, um, they're not envisioning the whole um, uh, schematic. And I agree, then, Renata. I mean, Renata, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, I think right now, uh, like Renata said, things are moving so quickly. Um, that we are unable to keep up. And I don't know how it's gonna play out, but I, it, technically and theoretically, I agree with what you're saying. Well, yeah, again, yeah. I'll, take, I'll take you back in history again to, to the start of pop art, when Andy Warhol put up the Campbell soup cans, which was a copyrighted image design. And then somebody put up Mickey Mouse, which was copyrighted. Campbell soup did not take them to court they just celebrate. They said, oh, that's wonderful. We agree with you, Andy. That looks great. But Disney, on the other hand, attacked every single artist who tried to use Mickey Mouse in one of its images. In, in terms of originality of content, um, Firefly, which is the newest AI engine that Adobe is releasing, they boast in their advertising that none of their images are scraped from the internet without explicit permission of the creators. And that's a new one. No one else is doing that at the moment. And uh, it also, I think, is derived from their library of stock images too, that you know they own the rights to, which I think is a you know an interesting and viable model. You know, when you look at things like iStock photo or Shutterstock, you know, they certainly could train systems on their library um but then and, and you know somehow compensate the contributors um in terms of royalties um maybe through the blockchain you know i mean that would be a pretty good application of um like fractionalization using the blockchain if someone implements it which you know they might hmm. yeah i don't trust adobe saying that um they have permission to use images. They pretty much rated um, the image websites, you know, uh, one by one and took over their materials and then slapped a hefty price tag on them for anyone to use. The licensing fees were high. So they have a very, you know, they're a good company and they're visionary in some ways, but they are uh, relentlessly capitalistic in their focus. So I don't know that I trust that um, they got everything, you know, on the up and up because so many other image um, sharing sites have been strong armed by them. You know, I can't recall them off the top of my head, but I. I remember as they fell one by one. The next thing you know, it's licensed by Adobe, licensed by Adobe, licensed by Adobe, you know? So I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that we're in a quagmire because um, we live in a, a, a society that is, is so monetarily based and motiv motivated. And the, the economics of situations uh, uh, favor those with a lot of money. And those without a lot of money, you know, just tend to suffer and be take advan taken advantage of. So we'll see. We'll see. It's likely to get worse before it gets better. Well, it's interesting to see that, like, if you search, 
the app store, for instance, on iOS devices for like chat GBT, it's all paid apps, you know, that are just using this, this open source system and monetizing it, which I guess, you know, um, open AI doesn't care about. Maybe they just uh, see it as a way of popularizing the system, but then it, you could just sign up, you know, for an account on open AI on the web and use the same tools for free. So um, it seems like that's a pretty popular model for, you know, apps, for mobile apps anyway, you know. Um, I mean, then again, you know, uh, Mac OS is built on top of FreeBSD, which is an open source, you know, Unix platform essentially with a nice wrapper on it. So it's not like a new idea. Um, but it, I think um, if anybody in here has any work that they've created using AI tools, you know, that might be interesting to share as far as, you know, um, viewers go to, to get a sense of the way that, you know, the artists in the group are using the tools. So does anyone want to kick it off or have any work they'd like to share? I know it's kind of impromptu, but um, it'd be nice to mix it up with some visuals if anyone has anything. One of the interesting things the lawyer said related to text was people putting in a subject uh, like um, how tall the Eiffel Tower was, for example, and uh, the the computer would come up, AI would come up with this answer, and then the writer would ask for proof. How do you prove that that is the correct answer? And AI would come up with an answer. And then when they would do research, they would discover that the answer that AI came up with was a lie that somebody had posted on the Internet. And the AI cannot tell the difference between the truth or the lie. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Very, very apropos of today, where a lot of people can't tell truth from lies, right? You know, so I think that's, um, I just want to bring back um, Vernada's brilliance of the um, Richard Nixon bobblehead pencil, I think was the most brilliant uh, natural intelligence today. So I don't know if you know, <laughs> has the capability of Thank you, Tommy. Being that brilliant. Bless you. Um, <laughs> So, but I, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, how how our sort of creative minds as artists are um, shifting as we add this as a tool to our tool sets of, of creativity. Do we start to just do more sort of free association of you know, words like Nixon bobblehead pencil and see what gets fed out? Um, and, and that becomes our, has it always been our artistic process? In, in some way, um, and are we just now seeing it um, through this new lens? Um, I wonder if we're we're too afraid, in a way, of AI. Not to you know, play advocate for the sort of AI sort of uh, you know side, if you will. But um, you know, I wonder if it's it's a flash in the pan. And if it really doesn't actually change a lot, you know, I think that right now there's a lot of experimentation with it and excitement about it, but not a lot of really interesting stuff. Everything seems to be AI-ish, right? Um, and uh, not, not very interesting. And that's actually my real worry, which I'd like to come to, is just a huge amount of bland content being generated and flooding all social media platforms or whatever, you know, channels of um, information exchange that we have and having to sort of filter and sift through um, AI in order to find, you know, the brilliance of, you know, a Nixon bobblehead pencil generated by somebody real, right? So that's my... It's an awful lot of repetition that I see. Whether, yeah, the, a lot of repetition. whether the artist is doing representational images or abstractions. In both cases, when I look at things generated by AI, I feel like I've seen this a thousand times already. Rightly, you can I don't tell. I want to see it again. 
you can tell, Lee, right? You can sort of see it. Once you've seen a couple of them, it's like, oh, pattern recognition. That's the AI yep. style of circle, circle relationships with the different color, um, tonality, shadings that, you know, are very common. You know. Anyway, and I'm sure it'll evolve, but, you know, it is this sort of um, not particularly interesting thing right now as an artist. I mean, I'm not sorry. I'm, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, I, I was at um, Rafiq, Anna Dahl's um, installation at um, the Museum of Modern Art. And I actually think that was particularly compelling, but maybe because of its physical presence, you know, and the physicality of this giant thing. Did I lose everybody? One thing that I've talked about a lot with Michael Price is that he and I are both sticklers, absolute sticklers for high resolution images. So I can tell it's AI just by the low res. It just hasn't gotten there yet. It's gotten a lot better. You know, we've got the version five for mid journey is a lot better than version three in terms of resolution, but it's terrible at mimicking other artists. You give it an artist's name. It gives you the idea, like Egon Schiele was one I put in. It's the idea of him, but it's not really his style. And it, and, it mimics things, but poorly because it doesn't have enough pixels. So that's why I'm I'm not so concerned about it taking over my my abilities. But isn't that short term, Renata? Don't you think that's going to quickly resolve itself? Oh, I think it's definitely going to resolve itself. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure that. I mean, I think it can. I don't know if it will quickly resolve itself, though, because the economics are such that it makes sense for them to focus on iPads and smartphones uh, because stuff looks really nice and sharp on there because you've got high res, small screens um, that a 1024 by 1024 or, uh, you know, 1280 by whatever, 896 looks really, really wonderful. Um, and Plus, the you know, they're and sampling the computing, source and the computing images. power and time to go from that to, say, a, a, a 9,000 by 6,000 pixel image is economically... Uh, that's a small audience that's going to want that. So I, I think it will happen. I just don't know that it's going to be soon. I mean, also, you have to think that there's these images are created from interpolating um, a library of source images. And if those source images aren't that resolution that you want, you're just going to be upscaling low res images to create these new images to begin with. So, I mean, I don't really see that there's a great probability that it's really going to get to the point where it's going to, you know, generate ultra high resolution images. Because if you start with just bitmaps, you know, I mean, um, you know, I don't, I just don't think it could, could do it. Well, I have a workaround to generate my own high res images and it works pretty good, you know, and it looks great when you use low resolution images. Um, I've, I've upscaled from 37 DPI um, to the point where it's indistinguishable from 300 DPI. Um, but I don't know that there are many people that know about that, but it has um, saved me a lot of time and frustration in being able to uh, create print worthy images from low resolution images, you know? So if I can do that on my limited um, resources, then I can only imagine what they're capable of doing. But like um, Michael said, um, whether or not it is profitable for them to do so um, is another question. And we know that this is profit driven. So if it's not a whole lot of people that's gonna want that function, then, um, you're not going to see it mass marketed. And if you want it, you'll them to uh, provide it. They will do so at, at an exorbitant cost. 
Actually, when I was previewing the Firefly, which is the Adobe one, they, uh, they do have upscaling software built right into the platform. Mm -hmm. And there's also Topaz Labs has had their software out for ages. It's, it's always possible to upscale, but if the, if the initial image is small, it's not really going to get you where you want to go. Well, you can get there, but it's, it's a, a lot of work around. I don't even know if I could tell you how to get there off the top of my head because it's something I just do instinctively, but there is a way you can get there, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've used things like perfect resize, which was like fractal something before that to create billboard art, you know, for another artist, billboard size art from his images, you know, but it's still, I think, an approximation, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like um, working with a giant gigapixel input device and getting that image to start with, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. When photography came into being, a lot of people obviously said that was the death of art and how the direction of art responded to that was, in one way was um, showing open brushwork or abstracts or things that the camera couldn't possibly do. And I was wondering what the corollary might be today. Is there something you, you look at, at a picture and you say, I know for a fact that's done by human hand be because of X. And if that would be the way um, art trends in general um, would go. I think the human hand thing is just another barrier to entry. You know, because you don't always need a human hand input on an AI generated image, but um, it, it's the way of people to say, well, show me, you know, because we can't just say this art is, we have to say it is whatever, you know, and they tack on a criteria um, as another hurdle for, uh, in order to obtain legitimacy. Um, because I firmly believe that the um, rights to AI generated images belong to the human beings that create the prompts. Because without the prompts, there is no getting to the point where you're gonna get that particular image, you know? So um, creativity is as creativity does. I just hope they- Do you think there would be an impulse to show the human hand? No. No, no, I, I, I look at the piece itself and I know that my mind is there because it would not exist if I didn't type in the prompt. So my mind is there. So I look at the piece as something that is um, independently um, sort of just there. And then I ask myself, well, you know, is this image complete as a work of art? Do I feel as though it needs more done to it? And if I don't feel that, then I leave it alone. Um, there may, on the other hand, be something missing. And I feel a need to go into Photoshop and add what I feel is missing. But um, my thing is to stick with the AI until I get what I want. If I don't see what I want, um, I just go at it again and again and again until it gets tired of me and, and gives me finally <laughs> what I've been asking for, you know. But um, um, uh, Colin had asked if we had projects to share. I do have a project to share. You've seen it before. Um, it's called Caterpillar Dreams. And um, I don't know if you all remember that, but it's a fable that I created. Uh, using AI, in which a young girl, um, a young Black girl, is in a, a field of beautiful flowers, and she's enjoying the scene and daydreaming when along comes a butterfly 
and the butterfly lands on a, a flower. And without saying any words, she and the butterfly have a conversation. The butterfly talks to her about the joys of um, crawling in, inside of a flower and gathering pollen and how it is to fly and be free and have wings. And the girl talks, tells the butterfly about how she totally enjoys running and reading books and imagining stories and talking with friends and laughing. And unbeknownst to them, there's a caterpillar in the grass and the caterpillar overhears the conversation. Then at, at the end of the afternoon, the little girl goes home to eat dinner and the butterfly flies away. Then the caterpillar um, crawls up to a leaf, up, up a plant, attaches to a leaf and becomes, starts spinning a, a cocoon, becomes a chrysalis. And as the sun sets, the caterpillar starts to dream, but the dreams aren't just of evolving into a butterfly, it sees its, its DNA dance around and it, it hears laughter, it sees someone running, um, there's visions of a book, then there's flowers, and it goes on and on and on until at the end of its evolution, we are left to wonder whether or not, the, um, we are left to wonder what emerges from the cocoon. Is it a um, butterfly who laughs and reads books? Or is it a woman with wings who can fly? So um, I had this and I presented it at the salon. And um, then I saw a call for submissions from the uh, Yale um, Center for Collaborative Arts and Media, where they are doing um, a project under the auspices of one of their divisions called Yale Space Ultra, in which they uh, explore the overview effect, which is you know the feeling that the astronauts got when they left the Earth and they're seeing it from a vast distance. Um, they are overcome by a feeling of unity and a need to rise above petty differences that tear human, human beings apart and to uh, live to make a better world. And um, later, some of them started the, um, organizations that actually speak and address to uh, this uh, overview effect in order to make it a reality in our society. So they wanted to explore metamorphosis and communication as a way of uh, communicating and reaching a higher goal between species as a prerequisite for the types of behavior we will need to have um, when we leave planet Earth. So mm -hmm. they asked for projects that exemplify that particular dynamic. And I thought that Caterpillar Dreams did that. So I submitted it and it was accepted. Uh, for publication uh, in a book, which they're putting together um, that's comprised of all the contributors to the symposium, which will be taking place on the 27th of this month. So um, I thought it, it would be nice to share Caterpillar Dreams with you all again, especially since that, you know, I first um, shared it here, first public viewing. So let me share my screen. So this is a, a video, but I'm gonna go one by one. And here we have the girl in the field. And the interesting thing is that when I described this scene to my sister, she had a similar experience when she was a young child. She had a friend who took her to his special place in the forest and he let out upon a vista of a field of wildflowers. And he told her that you could express your heart's desires to these field of flowers without saying a word. And she was uh, so impressed by that thought. And I guess they had an episode where they meditated in, in the fields of flowers and she never told anyone about this. And um, so that brought to mind what we call Kairos time, not only 
is the overview effect. It is Kairos time, which is um, fullness of time, the timing of time as opposed to the chronology of time. And here we see the, the DNA uh, dancing around and figures are shifting. And even more so, things are rearranging themselves. Metamorphosis is taking place. And here we see wing-like components. And here we see an arm and legs. And now we see more fully uh, human being beginning to form, but also with butterfly elements within it. And it's further solidified here. And here we see the juxtaposition of the butterfly and the human face. And here we see a woman who could well be an, an Egyptian figurine, really a hieroglyph of sorts emerging from the cocoon. And a final facial product, the butterfly in opposition. So I can stop share here. So that's Butterfly Dreams. Renita, thank you for sharing that. Hey, you, you were saying that all those pictures are straight AI prompt generations that you yeah, didn't they are prompt generations um but i did a lot of post-production work with them but i did not alter the um visual content um the images that i got from the ai were not as bright the, the colors were kind of murky you know kind of noirish and that's not my vibe so I had to work on it quite a bit in order to make it look like um, what I wanted. I wanted a gem-like uh, feeling to the colors. I wanted the blues to sparkle like sapphires and the reds to be reminiscent of rubies and, and things like that. Um, so, I mean, if you look at them, I mean, did you see anywhere where you felt like there was something that needed to be added, <laughs> you know? Uh, no, not at all. But I also felt like I wasn't sure whether I was seeing work that was done by somebody's hand or by AI, although I did see a lot of familiar AI-ish, you know, sort of the profile of the female is very, you know, similar to many other sort of female faces that I've seen generated from AI. But besides that one, I mean, I maybe it's because you change the colors or you push the AI prompts in a way to make it really what you wanted with the specific ideas of the geometric shapes that, you know, the, the one that I felt like I, I really was not sure at all was the, um, there's sort of a geometric uh, uh, backbone like shape emerging from somebody who's looking up towards the sky that you had that, you know, really, I mean, it's, it's been, I'm very happy to see what you're doing with it because it renews my uh, belief that there can be something interesting done with AI. Yeah, yeah, I, you, know, you can, you can. Yeah. I mean, I, I really had to, with each image, I had to fuss with the AI. I use Night Cafe for that. And I had to fuss with it and fuss with it and fuss with it. And fuss and fuss and fuss. And by fuss, do you mean like rerun it and change your prompt a little bit? And um, yeah, tell, tell the machine to say, no, you didn't get this right. I right. want, you know, to explore this, this, and this and, um, and wait for it. And I'd be there. I, I'd spend a whole night working on a single image. And, and it got to the point where um, well, Night Cafe has an option where you can choose four images at once instead of just one-on-one. -on -one. 
one image for one prompt. So I started using that thinking that it would increase the probability of me getting what I wanted. And when I did that, and when I chose that particular maneuver, um, I would look at the four options that it gave me and then pick the one that I felt was most like what I wanted and then proceed from there. And that way I could advance the image from one stage to another, to another. And when I felt like I couldn't um, add more to it, that's when I stopped. You know, I felt like it was complete. It looked like something. I, when I resonate within myself that, you know, okay, this is me. And then I'm, I'm satisfied. And I feel as though, you know, that is very much a part of my creative effort. And I'm not going to have no judge tell me that <laughs> I can't have right to my work. Right on. <laughs> I'm not feeling that, okay? <laughs> It ain't why it happened. All right. Uh huh. That's how that goes. So, <laughs> one, one of the things, uh, and I could show, I, I'd be happy to show just a, a, a small number of samples. But, um, Tommy, to your point, uh, I think if, and, and I think it was Chalda who, who mentioned the uh, photography aspect of things. And I mean, I do see a lot of similarity with, uh, if you take a look at most people who do non-artistic photographs, there's a small, they land in a very, very narrow range of interest. Um, and I think, you know, here's, here's this instant tool um, that I don't see very different than taking a camera and going out and taking photographs. Yes, there's difference, but there's the similarity of do something simple, press a button or type in a few words and you get something back. Um, yeah, sure, with a camera you point at stuff, but um, most people tend not to be very, very creative in the way they use a camera uh, if, if they're not really pursuing an artistic bent to what they want to see. So one of the things with... Um, mid journey uh, that I've been playing with is that it allows you to blend multiple images. And I've been using that um, just to play around with and to do some testing with imagery that I've created. So what I wanna show, show right now, and I'll share my screen here, um, is I went in and over a number of years, I did a lot of creative work using fractals. Um, so what I did was I used Midjourney to take a number of different kinds of fractal images, mash them together and see what the AI would come with, come about with. So here's just a few examples of that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm still playing with that. Uh, these are raw images. I haven't done any manipulation other than what the AI gave me. But, but for me, there's some interesting starting points of which I feel that, that I'm not seeing this with anything else. Um, so these are just a few samples. These are lovely. So anyway, I just thought I would share that real quickly. Uh, because the, the images that I was using as source <laughs> images uh, are very much outside of what you would see uh, from a lot of people who do typical uh, fractal work. Uh, and for me, the, these are seed images that I, I'm really interested in about pursuing and manipulating. Uh, but I just figured I would share that just off the cuff. So I hadn't planned to share anything today, but I, I thought I would add to the conversation a little bit. Thanks. Mm, they're lovely. 
Michael, are you saying that you took one of your images, your fractal images that was digital, and then put that into Mid Journey? Multiple images. You, Simultaneously. In, yeah, you could, there's a blend option in Mid Journey. So you could take from two to five images, put them in there, and then you, de you determine whether you want to have a square image, a portrait, or a landscape, and it'll look at them and do whatever it does. Now, for me, I did not add any other prompts other than the blending. So I haven't done anything more than that. So as far as I know, I don't know exact. See, this is the part that's frustrating to me. I don't know what it uh, what the AI does other than I'm assuming it's just looking at those images that I give it and then does something. Now, what that something is, what it's drawing from, I don't know. I don't know what the AI is is looking at other than my images. That's the way I understand it. That's the way it's ex been explained. But I don't know because I don't know what the engine is <laughs> under underneath it all. So I mean, I can recognize the source images in there, but but there's it's it's fruitful for a lot of experimentation, which I love doing. Uh, and for me, uh, just that sheer amount of experimentation gives me new ideas. And and that's the artist part of me that then I can run with that. But, you know, it's it uh, like Vernada was just saying, uh, it takes time and work and and you have to be persistent. I always find myself going to mid journey when I don't know what to do. <laughs> when I'm stuck in any way with my own artwork, I say, okay, let's go to mid journey. And all I need are two or three images generated and then I'm off again. It's kind of like an, I have another trick when I'm stuck creatively. I take out a very expensive high end interior design publication called The World of Interiors. And it takes you into homes all over the world and they're exceptional and after three or four pages of just looking at these photographs I just close it and go right to work it doesn't take a lot and I, I have a subscription now to mid journey I never thought I would but it's just a tool it's just a, it's just another stimulus creatively It and, is. I think for, and I think for a lot of people, it's just instant gratification. <laughs> or instant frustration. Because <laughs> it can really upset you sometimes what it shows you, you know? Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, uh, I think it was the night cafe that I was working with. It could have been, no, not, yeah, it was night cafe where I asked for, um, moss on the trees, you know, southern oak forest with moss on the trees, you know, and um, black people populating, you know, the ground and whatnot and um, like slave cabins nearby. And, um, and what it generated was um, a mass lynching instead of moss hanging from the trees, the people were hung from the trees, you know? So um, that was, I, I was tempted to destroy the image, but I said, no, this is proof of something, you know? And I may need this one day. And I, I think that's one of the dangers of our artificial intelligence is that um, the pool that it's wading in image-wise uh, can be very, very, very dark, you know? And sometimes it goes into those areas and it brings forth uh, elements from that realm. And it is, is, is vicious. Um, and uh, I can understand now why they have disclaimers at least on the, um, the generators that I use that, you know, 
there's no guarantee that what you're going to get from these uh, machines um, will be pleasant for you to look at. It can be disturbing. And so they have like trigger warnings attached to it. So um, yeah, sometimes it can be, you know, very disturbing, very frustrating. But you know what? I think that it is important that we maintain primacy <clears throat> of our point of view as artists and, and not give in to this uh, random darkness that can pop out at you from AI, but, but rather persist in our aesthetic to the point where whatever it is we're interacting with has to recognize and, and yield to it. You know, um, it is possible to train them, but um, it, it really takes a lot of determination. You know, you have to be determined. You're fighting for the soul of the world. So in many ways, we are like crusaders. I think because images like that, I mean, you know, that in itself is a really interesting, you know, thing to explore conceptually as an artist is to show you know this is what the ai gives you when you get a certain prompt um, not necessarily representing you know your work as an artist other than illustrating the the sociological you know implications of, of what the technology is doing you know i mean i think that that's that could be a very compelling use of ai is you know using it to reveal itself you know and show these biases um in terms of putting together a set of images that that is disturbing you know that is um you know illustrating that uh it's pulling from uh, you know a set of, of images that has its own intrinsic biases you know yeah it does it does you're right, evidence is that as evidence does, so it's useful. That's why I kept it. There's some things I throw away, but I didn't throw that one away. Bernada, can I ask you what software you use? On uh, Night Cafe. Night Cafe? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And I, I was determined to work with Night, Night Cafe because the images were so often disturbing, more so than Dali or any of the others. And I said to myself, okay, this, this, whoever makes this thing here has to do better, but it's never gonna do better if it's not confronted, you know? It, so it's a dragon, so, but dragons are not immortal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Vernada, on the other on the other side, um, and I appreciate exactly where you're coming from. Uh, but there's the other side of the equation is because I think there are a lot of immature people playing around with this stuff and would be happy to create all kinds of havoc and 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 uh, you know probably. And I hate to say inappropriate images, but you know things that that I, I think most of these companies don't want to see their engine creating. But as an artist, there are topics that I would like to be able to explore that are, from an AI standpoint, are barred because either they use concepts or words that they've deemed are are not okay. Um, and I and and sometimes they they you know rule with a, a a big sledgehammer to to make sure nothing gets through. But I I was doing I was trying to do something about the future universe and the heat death of the universe. But because death was a word that was included in there, they I got the message back saying you know that that's a, a verboten thing to do. So even though that's the correct term from a scientific standpoint and it has nothing to do with mm -hmm. like human human killing each other, um, I, I couldn't do that. So I had to figure out, think of different workarounds to do that. But there, there are topics I think that may be a little bit darker or maybe 
uh, off off the you know the normal track of of uh, thought that a lot of people have that can be frustrating. So I I find I find that they're they're kind of Disney are trying to Disneyfy um, the use of things. They want everybody to come up with nice subjects that are happy, even though a lot of people still do kind of weird weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. Can yeah. you put in your own <clears throat> um, images or? Are you, are yeah, you, is yeah. that possible to? Yeah, you put in, put in your own or others. I um, was part of this collaborative effort that was um, initiated by this company called Artly World, a nonprofit um, arts advocate organization. And it put together myself and two painters, all women, and um, we, um, were to develop a theme and um, explore it and create a online gallery from it, you know, based on the images. And so, but we were so different. Um, one painter dealt with uh, sports topics and uh, a young audience. Another um, dealt with sketches of uh, family members um, using pastels on paper. And um, and I, I had works on paper and canvas also, but um, had started to recently explore AI, but our interests were so varied um, and our style so different. And I said, okay, well, let's see if we can unify this thing and submit our images. Each of us take four of our best images from uh, what we want to illustrate. My topic was, you know, wounded earth. And um, there's, uh, you know, we're pertaining to their specific interests, um, the collection of portrait, you know, faces and another um, sports figures and politicians. And I submitted them to AI to see if we could get a uniform presentation of these disparate uh, works of art. And the, the results were just astonishing. It was so beautiful, you know, and um, I was amazed. I, I was totally amazed. I mean, I, I did it serially, um, each work I did serially. Um, and then I also put them all together to see what it would spit out. And uh, I was amazed. And the other artists who had not even thought about AI or uh, much less used it, um, they were very pleased with the outcome as well. So yeah, you can use um, other images, you know, but always like we did have consent if it's not your specific work, you know. I've been using AI um, more for illustration than in my own art. Um, you guys probably have seen some of the invites for the salons um, and I could share those really quickly. Um, you know, I found that AI was an interesting way or those, those types of graphics um, were an interesting way to uh, see, is it actually sharing that screen? Can you guys yeah. see the salon graphics? Yes. Um, sure. So yeah, you know, it kind of started actually on the salon that was the first salon on AI, which was um, 51. So prior to that, there were just sort of images, photo collage images from, from different things. And uh, from that point on, you know, and some of these are multi-layered images that are manipulated, but most of them were based on the topic of the salon and then kind of playing with different variations. Midjourney also gives you, you know, four different variations. Um, so it start with the prompt like cultural influences and then kind of work through a bunch of variations until I found something interesting or nightmares. Sometimes it just came up with something and I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. And I just ran with it, um, you know, but you could see sort of like um, 
you know, like this image and that image, they have a very sort of like comic book, like manga type style to them. Um, this one too, you know, this one I thought was particularly fun. The art pirates um, <laughs> image, uh, you know, I actually, you know, for, for a lot of these prompts, actually what I did was I threw the word expressionist into it just for fun. And this one was actually, the prompt was expressionist art pirates. So that's how it ended up with the, the <laughs> laptop, apparently, um, you know, and some of these other ones too, I did throw in expressionism or expressionist just to see, you know, if it would, if it would come up with something different. So I think this one too, I put in expressionist like media platforms or something. And it even came up with things that have like a little Twitter icon in there, you know, which I thought was interesting. Um, so anyway, that's kind of like what I've been doing, but, you know, and I did try coming up with images that were like based on some of my own ideas, not the actual images from my artworks, but, um, like wireframe, like wa the wireframe series that I've been doing as paintings for many years. I tried putting in, you know, like wireframe abstractions or this and that, and it just never felt like something I would actually sign my name to and put out there as my art but i think in terms of ideation it's interesting um and i know someone came on the salon a while back one of the earlier salons um about ai talking about how like uh you know the star wars franchise uses it um, to storyboard out you know new um star wars movies and stuff like that by feeding it the whole library of every single Star Wars film ever created. And then it can make a really good Luke Skywalker or a really good, you know, Darth Vader doing different stuff. So, I mean, I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's a way that like Hollywood is using this stuff because it would take concept artists a lot more time and it would cost the studios a lot more money to have human artists rendering out these things, you know. So in terms of commercial applications, I guess that's, one way that it could be used but not you know not at the individual artistic level necessarily or at like an industry level in in terms of commercial uses let's not forget the nft world it's really good for people who want to make projects that are multiple multiples of themselves have you noticed that the color has gotten a lot better since you started yeah it's definitely more varied you know, but um, I still see a lot. I mean, at least with Mid Journey, like um, it seems like each version it comes with like radically different look for like the same types of prompts. Um, usually, like I'll go into Photoshop and shift the hue around anyway because like I'm never happy with what it initially starts with. But um, yeah, it, it has improved, but it still has that predominant orange and teal that is the Mid Journey signature palette. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to contribute something. I wasn't going to because I have a cold, but um, a sinus thing going on. But um, I uh, have put my uh, project with AI aside for some other items and hope to go back to it the end of April and May. But um, I I uh, I can't use anything without making it more my own, and that has been my experience with the AI. Between uh, using my own image as the prompt, and also once I've created something, I I got to change it to make it more me and the um the attraction for me is uh, generating another layer because i'm so most of my work is about layers and layering and dimension and um to me it's attractive because oh another possible way to create a layer that i can make something else uh, as the end product. And I think I mentioned this in a previous uh, 
conversation in the slides about layers and maybe even before that. But I'm gonna just show a couple images. I have a file that I, um, let's see, I'm gonna to try to share content. Oh man, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. So um, I, I'm an iPad artist. Most people here know that, but I generated this image with Wabo because um, that's what I have on my iPad. And I used, I, I don't have the prompt, but it was pretty long about, um, uh, be, uh, I initiated it when I was having eye surgery and I was using my, the own image of myself with the black and blue that I had, although this doesn't show it as much as some of the others, the black and blue that I, I was playing with that image of my own face, which I use in a, a lot of my work, I have been for about seven years. And so I was using my own face, but I was also talking about um, my connection to the natural world and the power of female. And I was trying to, and I generate a lot of work that I hope to use as a series uh, in, in this year. And I've, gen and I've also made some other pieces that this is the one that I've liked the most so far. Um, so I used my own face and then this was me <laughs> with my damage, with my black and, blackened and purpled eyes. And I used that, this image of myself. I manipulated it more than this. And then I ended up with her. And so, and uh, she also went through a number of um, changes with eye colorama and other applications that I like to use in my work. And my, um, let's see, I want to come back. Okay. My interest is to create characters that are me and not me. I mean, that's been my whole portrait of a woman series is to take my own, I started with my own aging face and make something that's unusual and outside, possibly outside the cultural idea of what woman is, femaleness. And um, so that's where I'm coming from in using the AI. Like I, I feel like I, I wish to resist the idealized female form, which is constantly, like so much of the work is this constant. I, I, when I say idealized, I mean culturally idealized female form, a certain kind of facial look and all of that. And um, so I'm interested in finding something that's at least on not in that category or somewhat different than that category. And also to use me to become a different, I don't know, person <laughs> uh, or creature. I would say creature, yeah. So um, that's how I'm thinking about AI. Those are some of my thoughts. I probably would have more if I didn't feel sick, but um, I, I wanna be on the edge of it and use it as a tool in my work. I, I hope that's been clear. So that's what I'm doing. Although I've set it all aside because I'm a bit sick, but also I'm uh, doing a grant writing project this week, but I want to tune in and I like to hear what other people are saying, but all right. I'm signing off with my voice. 
Thank you, Susan. It's lovely work. You know, it's very challenging yeah. to work with AI in female faces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people shy away from that particular arena or just put up with it. You know, so it's good to see someone that's actually um, challenging that and using AI to create something that's multidimensional in its meaning. You know, not just about uh, lips and boobs, you know. Oh, and lips and boobs and tiny waists and legs. <laughs> stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> no one gets old on the internet, right? <laughs> like, oh my God, it's like another, another one, another one. <laughs> but um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I'm part of the culture. So uh, it's, it, it le I mean, even when I look at the piece today that I generated, I can see that there's some of that in there, but I'm hoping that I can keep pushing it and forming it into these creatures that have more resonance and more depth and more imagination. That's what I want to say, more imagination that, than what is provided by the tool. Like it, it, it's more amplified. Yeah. 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 That's, that's my goal. <laughs> I mean, that's been the goal for that whole portrait of a woman series forever is to amplify and like give something different, uh, more thoughtful that sparks interest in a way that other cultural representations don't do. And I like how the, um, the concept of fertility um, spills out in your in your work also. The concept of what? Of fertility, actually. And usually, I mean, we associate fertility with, with um, women in general. But generally, that affiliation wanes over time. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. But what your images say to me is that that is not a quality that wanes with time. It just changes. It yeah. doesn't wane, it changes, you know, metamorphosis. So you see the, these um, fairy-like or otherworldly uh, emanations associated with the, the face and, you know, the form itself. And I think that uh, it speaks to that particular uh, quality. Interesting. Thanks. So, yeah, so. I, whenever I do searches for, and I've talked about this before, whenever I do searches for mature female or aging female, it's, it's just like, uh, it's, it's devastating. Every once in a while, I find an artist who is using the actual face of somebody that's, um, you know, over 40, 50, 60. And uh, I'm always like, oh my God, I found something. But it, it, it happens very rarely. And mostly, most of the work is about kind of, uh, like a kind of, ageist isn't, doesn't encompass the kind of thought I have. It's, it's, so, um, it's so narrow, it's so narrow. And, and that is in response to what you said, like there's this narrow view of, of, of people as they age, like there's just so few categories to be in. And, and I think that's, it's insulting. I mean, you're either like the wise person or they're the grandma or they're the, it's just like, we're, it's so much, we're as humans, we're so much bigger than that. And uh, it's unfortunate that it, it gets uh, re reiterated over and over and over about the lim uh, our own limitations. And, and, you know, there's not a lot of people pushing back on that as much. I'd like to see more pushback on the uh, idealized female form, but I, I am not gonna bring, I have to tell you, I am not gonna bring it up on Twitter <laughs> because I don't wanna have that conversation. I feel fortunate to be able to have that conversation here because there's not a lot of places where I can have that conversation that people don't, it, it's harder, harder. So I appreciate that to be able to do that here. Are you are you familiar with the artist Egon Schiegel, Austrian artist around 1910? Say the first name. 
You gone. Share I don't them. think so. I'm going to write it down. I, I would I would suggest you look him up. Um, he he was striving to do something very similar to what you are talking about. Oh. Presenting images of the female form that do not fit the mm -hmm. uh, accepted ways of presenting the female form. Say the last name again. My head's she up. Shegel. Okay. It's, it's there's a there's there's a woman Sheila. on Sheila. It's S C H I E L E. Oh, Sheila. He, he died very young. Okay. There's a woman um, that I connected with on Twitter who's uh, her, she does um, hand work, but she's ambidextrous. She draws with both hands at the same time, and she does a lot of line drawings. Of, of, of the female form for sure. Yeah, there's that. And and uh, I can't remember the other woman I found through Twitter, but um, oh, thanks for the uh, information about that person. But yeah, if you ever see anything. Um, Just look, at, uh, look up Austrian artist 1910 and he'll be on the list. <laughs> okay. But so, Susan, you you bring up a, a rather interesting idea that I think would make maybe for a good topic for a future uh, salon meeting is with digital tools, um, since they are uh, programs and not all of them are necessarily created uh, for artist use or maybe artist centric uh, artists use them. I, I like the idea of when you said, I need to make it mine. And I think that's a great topic for, uh, for a salon is what does that mean? And how do we, as artists using digital tools, what does it mean to make it mine? Because we can often see the stamp of Photoshop on something or the stamp of mid journey or that you know pick a tool and you have to you have to be creative in order to make it yours but you know what that means for you is different than what it means for me and i i, I just find that an interesting because i i'm i'm right there with you uh i'm always striving to 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 say well that isn't quite me yet you know what does you know how do i make it me and what does that mean to make it mine so I, I, I'm glad you said that because I've heard so many artists say the same thing. Uh, we say it, but you know, like, what the hell does it mean actually? That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about Photoshop, but I remember, you know, when I first started seeing people using filters, and then all of a sudden, every image had like the twirl <laughs> filter or the difference. Um, you know, layer uh, the difference. Um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, the the blend mode. Yes. Um, you know, they all like everyone was just doing that same thing, sure. and then eventually, like now, it's sort of just. I mean, it's really there. well photoshopped images. Like you don't you don't really know that that it's used. You know what I mean? Like a lot of commercial images probably are photoshopped, and I certainly did my share of that stuff. You know, commercially, and. Um, you know, I feel like uh, with AI, I mean, the, the 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 thing that I think is sort of frightening is like the deep fakes that are that are so photorealistic, and um, you know, I mean, that could just seep into mass media or become propaganda so easily. You know, and um, I was starting to think in this conversation too, like it'd be really interesting if this uh, technology extended to sculpture. You know. Um, generating three-dimensional objects. I remember seeing something recently about, um, you know, AI generated um, uh, spaces like in the metaverse, you know, where it could be creating, you know, an, an actual environment based on prompts that then you can go into and navigate, you know, which I think would be pretty interesting. No, Colin, that's actually started to happen already there. I read an article very recently and I'm trying to remember where, but they were using AI to generate uh, uh, 3D printed buildings. So it's it's already starting. <laughs> yeah, they, that's they, amazing. 
they have a, um, 3D images being produced from photos now. I thought that was fascinating. But I've forgotten the word that they used to apply to it, but uh, I was amazed that the situation had uh, evolved to that point, you know? We go back for just a moment to your statement about make it mine. It immediately brings to my mind uh, the discussions between Van Gogh and Gauguin. Van Gogh insisted that he had to be able to sit and see the landscape in order to make it the landscape on his canvas, where Gauguin said, no, I make it mine, it comes out of my head. Okay, but in the long run, <laughs> in the long run, Gauguin won that argument because in the long run, Van Gogh would sit there and look at the landscape and then he would make it his. It would no longer look like that landscape, he made it a Van Gogh landscape. Mm -hmm. I think that touches on something re really ser serious there, Michael. Um, when when you're looking at at AI art and it looks like uh, like Tommy said before too, like obviously it, AI or or it just doesn't it, it it looks like the art is done by the AI. Um, it takes away from all these generations that we've had where we can look at at a painting we know. We know that's a that's a um, that's a Gauguin, or we know that's a Monet, or we know that's Van Gogh, or we know it's a you know um, um, any, any, if Bacon. You know, you, you, you even if you haven't ever seen the painting, but it's by Francis Bacon, you know it's a Bacon if you know his work. Um, so having that signature or having that the essence of the artist coming out is is, is a really tough one. Um, and I noticed that with. Um, I thought that your pieces that you showed today were really beautiful, and um, I've often tried to um, to uh, use these images in AI, and I've yet to really get them to do anything that I'm trying to do. Um, um, I've got a couple, and I and I like melding them a bit, but it's really it's really it's it's such a different kind of language. Um, but I, I did want to show something actually because I I did dabble in um ai a little bit um for uh for um this this woman she's doing blockchain projects for homelessness and getting housing for block for using blockchain and i don't fully understand it but i was like well that's really cool maybe i can donate some pieces for you so i did a, a little series uh i call it intensities um and, and if you don't mind i'd love to to show them get your your opinion um but they are they are reappropriated imagery. So um, does does I don't know if that's sharing. Am I sharing the screen right now? Nope. No. Uh, share screen. Okay. Um, let's share this one. Does that? Hmm. It yes. Didn't work. It did. Okay. So um, intensities. Um, I basically took as many tent cities as I could find. And, um, and um, oh, I, I apologize, technology. Uh, I can't seem to uh, scroll through them. Oh, I can, okay. So I looked and tried to find images that we might pass by on the street or, or um, see in a magazine or, or, or anywhere in a news report and glance over it with a passing curiosity like, oh yeah, more homelessness, oh homelessness, that's really bad, but not actually meditate on it. And, um, and what I've been doing with, with the uh, night cafe is um, you can meld different um, styles and they offer you like a palette of like 40 different paintings where they'll try to mix them. So the, the, at the bottom here is one painting but it, it usually um I'll, I'll mix about 40 different pieces together or, or you know sometimes i try to see how many i can do before it breaks um but i just really wanted to get the idea out to people that um these are images that we we see but we don't think about too much and can i find a way to to sort of 
make them a little bit more, have a little bit more permanence in people's me memory and in their consciousness. And so um, I ended up donating 50 of these to these people. They were in, uh, Flo in Florida, in Miami um, last winter. And, um, and obviously I didn't shoot these photos. I mean, I, they're, they're all re reappropriated. And I mean, that's a whole other political issue. I, I don't profess that these are my own. I just made something so that, um, and this one's obviously got like, it's like, it can be more cliche this one. You know, it's the scream kind of pours out. But um, I just, I wanted to support the organization and, and I thought maybe they could raise money and get their message out. That they're trying to work with homelessness. And, um, and what I found was interesting was, um, okay, this one, it's obvious that it's taking like a Japanese line cut, but my, my goal with all of these was that you wouldn't know, like there's, there's probably like, you know, 16 different images mixed in there. Um, so it just ends up being sort of painterly and colorful and like, yeah, it's a homeless guy. He's sleeping on a, in a, in a, a bus shelter. But I mean, you can actually, I know I'm scrolling right through them, which is the opposite of what my goal was, but I, I wanted to create something that, that, um, that doesn't necessarily scream um, AI. And um, I mean, this one does, cause it looks like a starry night, but um, they, I, I like the idea of trying to um, make it a little bit uh, more human, you know, and, um, and that's not a not an easy thing to do with with um, something like Night Cafe. Anyway, that's um, thank you. Um, I'm I'm glad I was able to show these. And how do I not sh stop sharing? Uh oh, stop sharing. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much for letting me peep in there. It's beautiful work, Lee. <laughs> very painterly. And I don't see how you could not see that as your work. I mean, how is that going to come about without you? Well, the, I need the, the, the photographer who took those photos. I mean, it might have been like a news report. A lot of those were, you know, actually I screen grab images like um, a news report and the camera's panning over mm -hmm. uh, a little shelter. But photographer shot that a videographer shot that and so they own it um and if it was printed somewhere somebody owns that image and then it would be very difficult to like do a, a sort of forensic a split of all the different um paintings that night night cafe mixed together um and i don't even remember I was just like, oh, I'll throw this one, try this one, you know, and, and they try to like, they want you to, they want you to have an image with the same palette as the image that you're taking um, so that they meld together. And if you don't do that, then paintings come out in different places. And um, because I did a, a 50 of these, I, I saw, well, because I did finished 50, I did like probably 200. Um, but I noticed things. I noticed like, okay, that don't use that image because that image, the impasto is really thick right in the middle and there's one spot. So mm -hmm. like if you have five pieces and you have that, that as one of the ingredients, you're going to have this tell. And I didn't like mm -hmm. that. So I was like, okay, there's, it's, it's interesting the way they, like the way they meld the images. Um, but I don't really know if it's necessarily um, intelligent. Um, you know, it's funny, you know, Bruce Sterling, right? Um, he, he calls it a uh, stochastic parrots and stochastic parroting. Like even if you're doing a prompting and you, you say um, Nixon Pez dispenser, it, it'll throw a Pez dispenser and Nixon or a bobblehead, it'll throw those images together and be like, is this what you're looking like? This is what you said, but it's, it's, it's a lot like a, a parrot the parrot hears the word could, could repeat the word but doesn't really know what it means you know and maybe some parrots will eventually learn if they're domesticated 
what a word means, but they usually just know the word and they can repeat it uh, usually all the time and without really any um, intelligence. Um, so it's, it's kind of funny that that it's that that this this is the intelligence that we see. Um, but so yeah, I don't know. It's mine. Uh, based on the, the lecture I listened to from the lawyer, um, I would say that you uh, have reached the seventy percent threshold for sure. You changed those images more than seventy percent if they started off being naturalistic photographs. So I agree with Renata. You you are there. That's you. Uh, thanks, Lee. Thanks. Yeah, you were just inspired by a photograph if you went way past the photograph. I have a I have another series that I've been doing um, about climate change. Same kind of thing of these these ghastly situations, flooded you know cars where the the water is right up till here, and and a whole parking lot flooded or all these things that we see these images, but I figure if we can make them, like you said, Vernada, like make them look painterly, make them look like not just another news photograph, but actually something like if I had the skills, um, somebody who, who's known me for a long time, when I posted a few of these was like, Lee, are you painting again? Like they were all excited. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, who has the time to like, to like get an easel and and like I'm not I'm not gonna like how would I where would I go? I'm I'm not gonna be in a flood, hopefully. So how would I create those images without taking a piece from here and a piece from there? But uh, I'm glad you said that. So I'm not gonna be as shy with them. I was kind of afraid to show them. So can I just ask for a clarification? The original is from one photograph or multiple photographs? I get the different painterly styles going on, but. Oh, multiple photographs, multiple photographs. Although each individual image is a photograph. Well, no, that's what I wanted to know. Right, so On one. Each image, so there was an image of homeless tents like this. You didn't take another image of homeless tents and multiply the number of homeless tents. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. And so sometimes I do a screen grab, like if the camera's panning across a news report, but mm -hmm. most often I just like look, you know, I just do Google searches and I'd be like, um, you know, Tent City and, and pick a name of a city, Tent City, Chicago, Tent City, London, Tent City, uh, you know, and, and um, yeah, pull, pull up and be like, wow, that's a dramatic image. Okay, let's see what I could do with that one. <laughs> but but um, um, so yeah. it's kind of, I mean, I mean, my whole life I've been a VJ and I used to be an analog VJ. And, sorry, um, and I mixed my imagery. Um, some of the images were images that I made, but I I had a, you know, when I go to VJ, I'd have a, back when I started, I'd have milk crates full of VHS cassettes. This is before digital. I mean, when we went digital, it was so amazing. But um, so I, I, I'd um, curate, and and part of the work was curating. Part of the work was knowing what clip, clip like, I, because the VJing is a lot in in the dance clubs. Um, so I, I, you know, go and look for old Bob Fosse movies and see what I could loop. And then I'd make a loop from from one of those movies, and then key other images into it, and and then have that being beat reactive. So if it's like in a house music at 120 beats per minute, I'll be making like 60 cuts. So those aren't my imagery. The thing that I own is the mix that would come out. Um, and even then, there'd be a you know questions about authorship. But um, I've always been like, you know, I found fitted footage filmmaking when I was in film school. Uh, the idea of um, the archival imagery and, um, you know, uh, back then they used to call it junk smithing, <laughs> like just like going through all the, all the uh, cretinizing images and the, the television commercials and everything else and trying to create something with it. And um, before, um, I think Michael said, um, um, so no, Lee said about Disney and how you could, Disney wouldn't let you ever use their their footage and then there's um a band negative land who went out of their way they had a bit of a kerfuffle 
with Disney and they made a whole, um, a whole, um, well, they recorded their law, the Disney lawyer yelling at the, how he'll sue them if they use any of their footage. And they switched it to um, the uh, mermaid, Ariel, the mermaid, the Disney mermaid. And um, it was just a pretty fantastic piece about, about, you know, using found footage. And so I think there is something to that. Um, but at the same time, I feel like a, a, a bit of a thief taking these images um, of, of all these tent cities and, well, and making them pretty. It was legal. It is legal. It's called compilation. And the compilation is where you take many images uh, that other people have done and you create a new image that is very much more expanded and very different from the individual uh, images that comprise the whole. So yes, yeah, so it's legal. It's recognized by law, compilation. And if you want to copyright them, that's how you would do so as a compilation. But these are not actually compilations. They're modified, um, but they're from one identifiable photograph. So then it's this question about how much it gets changed. And it seems that you've changed it dramatically, so I would. Well, I understood that he used multiple images in many of the pieces, am I correct, Lee? Um, well, uh, there's, but, but I didn't um, composite any imagery. Like I'd, I'd take the photo and maybe I'd crop it, but I, I, I was, I'd look for images and I'd, I'd take it and then I'd start processing it. I wouldn't do a, a, a composite, composite or a collage of like, I wouldn't take it this tent and put it in, in this field. Um, I, I just take what's, what's there. I mean, I mean, part well, of it was- isn't, isn't it true that any anything on the web is like up for grabs? No, that's not true. Absolutely not, not true. true. That yeah. is like so, so much not true. Well, like if you put, <laughs> if you put something on Facebook, they own it. No, they don't. No, they don't. There's, I found the words. You know, they can use it, but they don't own it. And they no, can no, modify I mean, it. I don't mean they own it, but, but you know, it, it, you can, it, it's up there for grabs. They no, it's not. It. You own the copyright on your work. Yeah, from the that time is, you create it, you, you yes. own the copyright. You are very well protected under US copyright law. You own the copyright. So that it, is the question of what Lee brought up, which is how much you've changed it. And have you, I mean, Lee Musgrave said that, um, have you changed it enough that you've enhanced its value, modified it, et cetera, um, but absolutely 100% just putting it online you ne do not give up ownership. Nobody would, no artist would have a website if that was right. 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that's hey guys, we are um, we are a little bit past the time <laughs> limit. Um, you guys are all welcome to stay around for the um, advisory board meeting, which you're all part of. And uh, you know, at that point, we'll discuss the topic for the next salon, and. Um, you know, if anyone who's watching this on YouTube or on the website wants to be on the advisory board, the application process involves showing up and hanging out after the recording stops. So um, I thank you guys all for participating and we are going to end the recording in three, two, one and cut.